This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Taking the Lead. I am Christina Brady. I am the SVP of sales at Speckit, where we help to make every single rep, CSM, or BDR on your team the very best rep, CSM, or BDR on the team. Uh, And of course, I am your host. I am so excited to have Stephanie Valenti on the show today. Long time coming. Steph, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I cannot imagine how long you and I have talked about getting together and it is finally happening. It's like a fangirl moment. I love it. We're doing it. We're making things happen. And that's what powerful women do is they get together and they make amazing things happen. And speaking of amazing things, when I just think about some of the incredible accolades that you have, top 40 CROs to watch two times top 100 most powerful women in sales. Like these kinds of things give me goosebumps. And I can only imagine your story and your professional journey to get here and do what you've done and what you've had to navigate. So tell us exactly how you got where you are and what happened along the way. Yeah. You know, they give me goosebumps too, because this isn't what I thought was going to happen when I started my journey. You know, as I think back, there are people that do things because it was a part of their plan, right? They said, I'm going to do A, and then I'm going to do B, and then we're going to achieve C. And mine wasn't like that, right? It was wild and crazy and all over the place. And I think back to where it all started. And where it all started is, you know, originally when I wanted to go to school, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor, right? I had planned. This is what I wanted to do. And funny thing happened, I got pregnant. (laughs) So got pregnant really early on. I had my first child at 19. And talk about something that'll throw a boomerang into your quote unquote plans. A child or a pregnancy will do that. And so it, and I, I go all the way back like that because it really did make an impact to my journey and what allowed me to have like some of that grit and determination and risk taking that I have today. And so I go all the way back. Now it was crazy, right? So I was working three jobs, going to school, you know, watching a little baby, all very, very young. And, and what I realized really quickly is, I don't want to do this. And I also don't want to be a stereotype, right? Like I had plans in my life, like I'm going to run. And I didn't know how to get there though, right? So I started with the easiest thing I could, which was like, I'm going to go waitress and do restaurant and bartend. And But what I really fastly saw was, oh, like I'm going to conquer this one and then what's that? And then I'm going to conquer this and what's next. I'm going to conquer this and what's next. And it happened in restaurant. It happened in a medical office. It happened in all these side jobs. And someone at one point one day looked at me and they're like, Steph, you're 25 years old. You need to just go be in sales. Like you're way too dang driven. Like go be in sales. Way too driven. (laughs) Way too driven. (laughs) What is that? Right. But great feedback. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for that feedback. And so, yeah, that's what I did. And so I got my first opportunity after a very short stint in car sales, because that's what I thought sales was, right? Did that for a very short stint, was great at it. But I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. I got an opportunity at Staples Business Advantage selling B2B contracts Mm -hmm. for things like supplies and printing and janitorial and learned how to solution sell, went through Sandler training in classroom, like hardcore training. And I fell in love, fell in love with it. It was unbelievable. It was so good. And I realized, oh, like if I work two hours longer, like I'm going to make more money and then ultimately be like the best at my job. Oh, like I can do this. Like, I- we love that. We love that. Yeah. <laughs> The volume in. And so the rest is kind of history for my actual like sales and sales leadership experience. So did 
business development um, as an individual contributor, then quickly moved into leading a team for the first time. Um, I got to take over a tough team. I got to do a a brand new territory. This was all outside sales, right? I'm I'm aging myself. This was outside sales. (laughs) I did it too. I did it too. (laughs) And it was fun. I mean, it was fun, right? It was fun. You're driving around in your car. You're stopping by. You're writing. I used to like write leads down on a piece of paper while I was driving around. Yeah. Because we didn't have Zoom info. No, we had MapQuest. We had we had, we had MapQuest. That we had to print before and heaven forbid they changed the address because then you were like, well, I I mean what what would you say is your favorite outside sales story of just your experience? Because I do think that that is something so many folks can't relate to. Like tell us a tale. <laughs> you know it's At one point, I said, oh, I have a business idea. I'm going to create a coffee table book of the experiences you have when you're in outside sales. Because I could, we could do an entire podcast session on that. I mean, I would be driving to an appointment and you would see very interesting things happening on the corner of the road, right? In an industrial area. I've gone in and they always give you tours of their locations because everyone's so prideful, right? So you go in and you're like, I'm trying to sit down with wow. the head of facilities and they're like, ooh, well, let me show you this. And let the, me It's always the cafeteria, you. isn't it? It's like, can we show you the cafeteria? I was like, if you want to show me where you eat and drink, I would love to see you that. May, Let's take a look. You, may, you are a thousand percent on. Or their supply closet. Like yeah. they're opening their supply closet. I, yeah. I, yeah, so many look stories. Yeah, so many fun things, but there were so many positives too. You know, yeah. you're 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 getting to meet so many people in person. You're getting to take in their space. Like, talk about mirror and match. Imagine doing that in person, right? So there were a lot of positives, and and I really did fall in love with it. And didn't have much inside sales experience until I took my first executive position. So, which was you know that after I was at Staples for about like seven eight years. I and I loved my job there. Like I really do say that most of my success that I've had today is because of the experience that I got at that organization. So many yeah. wonderful people that are in SAS today came from the Staples Advantage side. So wow, yeah, you go it, once you once now that you know you can look at it. So like Amy Appleyard, who is a VP of Logmian, is there? Like Jesse Demond. Anyway, I could go on and on. Brian Merrick. So, um, but lots well, of thanks. I'll, I'll go down that there. rabbit hole now. Can't wait. Yeah, no problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was, yeah. it was great. It was just such an amazing experience. And so I had taken so many roles. So went from individual contributor all the way through to like a director GM role where I was managing sales, but also operations and a couple of other things in enterprise and market and small business, you name it. Yeah. And I had gotten the call, right? That that executive recruiter called me and said, hey, you just got to have a conversation. And it's like, I'm not looking. She's like, you just got to talk to this person. So that person happened to be a CEO that was looking for a VP of sales to create their B2B division within an organization. and. I was always at, that was like a fortune 100 with 80,000 employees. And I'm like, I'll explore it. And so it was wild. Wow. It was wild. I, I don't think that you expect that kind of a builder opportunity at a company of that size. That feels pretty rare. Yeah. So, so they, yeah, they, they said, go build this. And, and so I left Staples I said, okay, like I'm going to take this opportunity. They offered me at the time crazy money compared to what I was making in my old role. So it's, and they, I had to move my family, right? So I said, all right, we're going to do this. I got there. They offered instead of VP, they said, hey, we just know that you're going to be the right person for us. So we're going to give you an SVP role, but we're going to make it global and we want you to handle everything. And of course, I'm a yes person. So I'm like, okay. Yeah, like love let's it. Do it. Let's more, do more, that. more, more, more. Let's do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can. I can do hard things. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the most challenging thing that I've ever done in my life. And you've already heard some of my challenges, right? It was so challenging. So we started in 2017. It was a 300 million dollar company 
that had existing, very like transactional business, and they wanted to build that B2B unit with a new product line. And all of the people that were on the executive team were very B2C background. Like the CFO was from Skechers, right? Oh, wow. So big executives. And here I am sitting at the executive table. Never have I done that before. And I'm the only one with B2B experience. How many women were in the room? There was one other woman. This was a large executive team. I think at one point it was eight or nine people. There was one other woman and she was responsible for product and helped do some stuff over in China. So she went back and forth. Wow. So as a actual like very large business unit, I mean, I was responsible for all revenue, right? So here I am. I don't know how to create forecasts or do revenue planning right. I don't know how to interact with a CFO. In I've always interacted with other sales leaders, right? So I'm interacting right. with all these people. And I think, I don't even think it's going to be a thing. I didn't know, right? Like, of course not. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> So you don't know what you don't know at that point. You're like, I'm just, okay, I'm going to just figure this out as I go. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's make it yeah. happen. And there was, and I, I didn't know about Pavilion. I wasn't in the SaaS community. It was in very much like product and like commercial real estate and commercial furniture. And so here I am like trying to navigate this thing and the CFO and the CEO come to me and I teach this in my revenue forecasting class now because of this moment. They came to me and they said, Steph, if we want to grow this new business line by $100 million, how many headcount do you need? And I didn't know better, right? I didn't know better. So what do I do? I was thoughtful. Like I went and I was like looking at past historical information for what I could. I looked at like all the headcount we have. I looked at quotas. What do I think each head can do? Like you spent a lot of time on it. Ultimately, that is a really bad response to someone asking you, how do you do a hundred million? The salesperson go in their little silo and they're like, oh, I'm going to tell you and I need 70 people. And, and, <laughs> and like, well, if and, I take their average quota against their average attainment and then I, I play that against their ramp time, I got a 70. How's that? Is that sound? Does that sound that's good? Not right. Well, and who are you <laughs> going to ask? Right. And I think that's, that's the Enough. crux of this is who, who are you going to ask? You're the only person in your organization with the title that you have. You're brought there because you're supposed to have all of the answers. And yep. unless you know a bunch of other SVPs that just happen to be a part of your network. But like, I think what you're getting at is network wasn't wasn't as easily accessible and it wasn't something wasn't. that you naturally felt like you built. Like I remember in 2017 feeling buried. So buried. before having community, you're in your first big exec tech role. And you're doing your own, re- what did you, where, where'd you go to get some of your, re- was it Google? Did you Google it? Or did you look at, how did you do it? I, I tried to grab some mentors, all of which, because I was in Fortune 100, they didn't know either. Like they right. didn't know either, right? So they're like, it sounds like your methodology makes sense. It sounds like it's the right thing. And the people around me, because they were from B2C and I was coming in to, for, to build B2B, my CFO and my CEO and the COO and the, the rest of the team, they didn't know how to challenge me either. Mm. So what I'll say is the first year was actually really thinking fun because yes, there was like the annual planning piece of this, but, and I had to learn some of the forecasting and stuff the hard way, but yeah. man, did I make an impact? Like I did like strategic, you know, org design and they'd never done that before. And everyone, no one really had roles and titles and I created those and we didn't have diversity and I got to bring that into the mix. And we didn't have like training, like no one had been through a sales training. We didn't have segments. So we did amazing things and we actually hit unbelievable revenue numbers in the first year. But it was still hard. Right. Because yeah. my conversations with that CFO, who is a very, he was a very challenging person for me because I, I didn't know how to speak to him in the right way. And he didn't know how to speak to me in the right way. It was, it was challenging and it took a lot of hard conversations, some tears, honestly, some wondering if I'm good enough. And, and when we got into year two and mid year three, I'd say mid two was okay. Year two was okay. Year three was incredibly tough. 
There was so much directional and strategic change. I was trying to make the best decisions I could, but I definitely felt isolated and alone. And I, if I look back, oh, I would have done everything different, like everything because of the knowledge I have today, but I just didn't know. And so that is like one of the things, Christina, that I think about when I, I do give a lot of time to mentoring. I don't charge people for it unless I'm on like a weekly engagement type thing. And I do it because I didn't have it. And people deserve some help, right? Like they do. I didn't get it. And so I want other people to have it. And so, yeah, so um, crazy fun. I learned more. So all my like foundation with Staples, that next role is my first executive position. That was where I made all my mistakes and learned from all of my mistakes. I mean, and until you make them, though, it's one thing it's difficult because you can look back on that and in 2020 say, man, if I knew if I knew then what I know now, how how different could things have been? But you had you had to go through that. And to be honest, that- I think one of the most mind blowing things for me is if I didn't know that you were talking about a three hundred million dollar org, I would not assume I would assume you were talking about a startup. Right. And it's kind of crazy because you assume that these large mega companies have it all figured out. Right. They've got the formula. They know same problem, different day. Right. And so there's almost no way that you could have prepared for that. And what's crazy is. One of the biggest learnings that I had was when I'm asked a question is what questions that I ask right back before I give you the answer. And like, that's a learning, right? So somebody comes totally. to you and says, hey, we've got to do a hundred million in revenue. How many heads do you need? And I'm like, that's the wrong question. We want to do a hundred million in revenue in net new business, in expansion business, in what segments of the business, in what amount of time, like how totally. quickly do you want to scale that? What additional resources am I going to have? How's marketing yeah. going to help me? Right. Yep. You suddenly learn, oh, I actually can't That's answer right. that unless you give me more information. But when you don't know, you're like, okay, let me just come up with a number for you real quick. Yep. That's the seat at the table. What you're describing is when you yes. have a seat at the table, you know how to just not be an order taker. And your first time doing anything, you're like, you tell me jump, I'm going to say how high. That's exactly and right. So that got you ready for your next role, though, which you made a bit of a shift here. You went from SVP of sales to COO. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was purposeful because I was, like I said, I was a fabulous, very experienced sales leader, but I didn't understand finance. I didn't understand operations. I didn't understand HR and the impact they could make. And I had a someone I knew from the market that I had actually interviewed for a role for, for my team during my time in that SVP role. And he had gotten a CEO role and he had come to me and he said, Steph, I'm growing like insanity. And I know that you're really good at just leading a team through change. Can you come help me? And I did not like their revenue model. So it was very antiquated and they weren't willing to change it. They weren't willing to change it, right? It's It was like three steps removed, right? They sold to a rep who sold to a dealer who sold to the end user. And I'm oh. like, yeah, I don't have control over that. So I don't. Good luck forecasting that. Like, okay, it's going to be, you know, yeah, you have to predict three steps down from here. What's it going to be? You're like, I can't control any of that. No, yeah, <laughs> no, know. thank you. But yeah. I said, I will come fix your operation. So he said, yes, please. So, so I did that and I did it for a year and a half. I learned. So my entire life, this is the way I put it, the entire life I was a gas pedal. It was say yes to everything, run as fast as you can, make crap happen. Right. But for the yep. first time I had to learn how to be the brake pedal. Like, wow. yes, but no, right. Operations can't do that. Right. Like I had to put on that other hat. And it was a enlightening experience because I realized all of those times that I was like demanding things from the rooftop and shouting that we need this to work. I now know how my counterparts felt, right? Like I yes. learned how they felt. And so I loved that job, like loved it. I realized I am very good at operations and I I was great at restaurants, so I understand how that carried over. Like, I like being an operator. I can simplify complex problems. So um, so I did that. The only reason I left that job is because I got bored. 
I got bored. I there weren't enough. Pro- there weren't any more problems for me to fix. They were in like a very like we want to just comfortably grow, opposed to reinvest in fast growth. And yeah. and so so I was like, what's next? I mean, being able to identify that is really scary because what you just outlined also sounds like comfort and yeah. security. Yeah. Which I think it was. To, it was. Yeah. To have the bravery to say, this is really comfortable and I'm making really good money and I'm really safe and I'm not actively challenged, which means the stakes are pretty yeah. low. I would think, especially as a woman on a C-suite, that nine out of 10 would say, you know what, I'm going to yeah. I'm gonna coast here a little bit. But instead, because you like pain, you jumped back <laughs> over. You jumped back over to the revenue side of the house. You then popped back over to CRO. I did. This is, yep, I love this. I sure this did. is the best. This is the best. So then you go to CRO. Why jump back into CRO? Because you, I assume you could have gone back into operations there, but something drove you back to revenue. So actually, I ran both. So when I, in my next CRO role, I was also running operations and all of our delivery teams. So I had total go-to-market responsibility. That's so the way. sales, marketing for the first time. So I'd never led marketing. So Ooh. took on marketing, took on client delivery, rev ops, and product. I have a feeling that's when you, that's when communities existed, right? Because we're talking about like 2022, somewhere in there. And now you're taking out, like, how was it different for you ramping into a new role when you actually had ways to go and get answers? Yeah. So I actually, if we pop back to that COO role, that's when I found Pavilion and started to be into in that community and started teaching courses and meeting with people. And that was one of the other things of like, oh my gosh, all of these people are having these challenges and I want to challenge. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Challenge. So, so I actually found my new role through Pavilion. It was a connection and I got in and I had so many people to support me, especially running marketing for the first time. Like Look, I I feel like at this stage in my leadership journey, I can lead any department because it's all about leadership and accountability and asking the right questions, right? But marketing beast. Marketing is straight up a beast, especially in what the last two years gave us with just the change in demand generation and inbound, outbound, things don't work the same, right? So it was definitely challenging, but a different experience. I was in services for the first time. I was way more in the tech world than I've ever been in. It was PE back for the first time. So they're involved. They're involved. They're involved. So it was a lot of first times. I feel like all my experiences are first times. But again, like great successes, lots of learnings. I, I had more pressure in that role than I've had in any role that I've ever been in before. I ran two acquisitions. In that role, wow. I was only there for a year and eight months. So, but a lot in a year and eight months. It, it was a lot. We did a full reorganizational design, like to, you know, make sure that we were serving our clients in a better way. We were trying to take something that's always been inbound and add some outbound elements. Like it was wild. It was yeah wild. But again, great experience. It wouldn't take back. But here I am in another role. So where you're doing um, both, where you are again. So you, I really do feel like when you're talking through this, this, I don't want to call it a hybrid because I really do think that depending on the size of the organization, that amount of go to market oversight is important. Even when I think about things that there's infighting over, things like uh, attribution, right? How much infighting happens between marketing and sales on attribution and who we credit and who owns what part of pipeline? And it's like for you to be, Totally. The single owner, you have to look at it objectively. It's a lot of work. Like that is a hard job because each of the things you were doing is a full-time job. But in the role that you're in right now, you're there again. So you're still COO and head of revenue. You're doing both. I'm is this, both. do you feel, do you feel more comfortable now after having the experience at your last org, being able to execute on some of this stuff? 
A thousand percent. I feel like, yeah. you know, I feel like every single step of my journey has prepared me for a role like this. I have a lot of people ask me, and even when I was talking to executive recruiters, they were saying like, do you want to be considered for a CEO role? You kind of have those experiences. Are you yeah. ready for that? I think this is an opportunity for me to dip my toe and see if that's what I want. We run EOS here at my um, new organization, and which means I manage up. To the vis- I'm the integrator, right? So I'm managing yeah. up to our visionary, which is the CEO. And then I have the entire organization as my direct report chip. And so finance, HR, uh, marketing operations, all the store locations. So a lot of new things. I've never managed multi-location. I've never managed B2C. And I've never been in healthcare. So I'm a weekend. So I don't have You're any like... I'm a weekend. I don't have any great reflection points yet. I'm in the thick of it and I'm learning. But you've got the plan, right? So I think yes. right now, one thing that has been really, really constant in this market is people are moving and shifting within their roles and they're finding themselves in every new role saying, hey, there's this really important thing that is a core part of the job that I'm doing that I've never done before. So today you're in this moment, this point of inflection, you're one weekend, you have so much to learn. How do you, at a, in a C-suite position, go learn what you have to learn to do the job? Like, what are, what are yeah. your next couple of weeks in terms of self-enablement going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I have it pretty well built out. You know, last week was my first week. I'm doing a lot of shadowing and listening. I have a sticky in front of me that says seek first to understand because I'm a sixer. And so I'm actually in a lot of pain <laughs> right now. <laughs> Because I'm I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> because you see it and you're like, oh, that's so broken. Or oh gosh, if I could just do this one little thing, right? But you can't do that. So right. my first my first 30 days is a whole lot of shadowing and understanding. The first thing on my list is I need to map out our entire entire customer journey. And that's not just through like looking at what we have. It's actually not looking at what we have and listening to calls. It's looking at our website. It's it's being, it's actually filling out the form fills for the experience. It's going into store location. It's sitting in the marketing team's meetings. It's I actually did a secret shopper. So I know where some of the pinch points are for myself before I started the job. So I like went through and, and wrote all of it out. It's, it's being immersed in it and then writing it all out. Then like that's step one. So that's my 30 days. Like I'm spending that's step time. one. That was step that's, one. That's step one. Step that's step one. one. Step two is people and culture, right? Like a new executive coming in is terrifying. Like it's terrifying. Yeah. It just is. It can look ex- exciting and, and whatnot, but it's still scary for people. So I've already started um, sending an email a week um, to the entire organization. So I sent my second one today. I'm in week two, um, but they're light and they're fun. And it's like, here's what I'm focused on today. And like, Here's a piece of my personal life. So like my son's birthday is tomorrow. So I said, we're going to go. He has a love language is food. So we're going to go get sucked. Can you believe he orders a little vibe? Like it's giving them some of me and it's layering on is some exposure to what am I seeing and what am I going to do about it? Right. So that's, that's the portion there. And then no matter what organization I go in, I have one-on-ones with every single person in the company, no matter what. And so my theory there is I come in, I get to know them personally. I ask them about how long they've been at the company and what their like journey has looked like. And then I ask them one question every time. If you had a magic wand and you could change one thing, what would it be? And I've done this in all of my executive positions. I actually consolidate all of that data. So here's my like fun side and then the data side. I actually consolidate that data to find after my first 90, what are the things I'm going to focus on first? And it's where do I see trends in what people are saying? If everyone is saying that our business development engine's broken, well, guess what? I should probably go focus on that, right? So, right. but that's my three steps. That's what I do. So I'm doing it right now. Okay. Well, in a couple of minutes, you just laid out a little bit of a master class on ramping in an executive new role, which I'm a little bit blown away by. I, 
the fact that you also lead with empathy and people first and the fact that your gut instinct is I'm going to be kind and I'm going to be caring and I'm going to show people who I am and I'm going to create this warm environment. Yeah. It's also where then you can leverage accountability. It's where they can rely totally. on you. I just think the soft skills, the hard skills that you laid out in enough are, like I said, a master class. But the soft yeah. skills, I feel like, are what so many people miss. And we could probably do an entire other show just, okay, so now yes. the soft skills of being an effective leader can we talk about it? Maybe that can be a part two, yeah. but for today's what we'll call. Yeah. Today we'll call it part one. Part yeah. two is coming. And then for part one, it is time to get to our rapid reveal section. If you are up for it. Let's do it. I'm ready. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So I've got three questions for you. You've got 60 seconds or less to answer each. Number one, what was the last great idea that you had? Mm, to join the medical industry. It was a great idea, you think? This is a- I, I think it was a great idea. <laughs> I love I'll, that. Let you know I love- I'll let you know in 90 days. We'll report back. We'll report back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that ties into number two. I don't know. But what's an irrational fear of yours? Oh. So on the personal side, like I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I don't know what it's been. My entire life terrified like i don't want to see one i don't want to kill one yeah. i don't want to look at them at the zoo i don't like it right so totally yeah. irrational on more of the business side i don't know i i'd say in the past i had a lot of irrational fears like yeah. but today nothing really scares me anymore uh-huh. like i figure what's the worst thing that can happen if i can live with that then what's the risk and what's what's there to fear so yeah just spiders i guess I mean, we we call that a growth mindset is what we call that. I mean, I love it. And spy, I mean, that's a popular one. They are gangly. Gross. All right. So you're not going to take on a job as like a spider. I almost said trainer. Could you? I'm going to be a spider trainer. Okay. Number three, (laughs) what is a new skill that you're working on that you haven't already hit on? Because I feel like we just hit on so many. Yeah. Yeah. So I know nothing about multi-location operations at all. And if I think about even my community, they don't really know anything about multi-location operations either because my community is SaaS, right? Like, and I'm not in SaaS right now. And so although it's recurring revenue, it's not SaaS. So I need to, I need to learn that. And I think that there are differences and variances that are going to come in and I've got to brush up. So if anyone's listening and has experience, I would love and be honored to talk to you about that. Well, along those same lines, where can folks find you? How do they connect with you? Yeah. So I'm really active on LinkedIn. I've been a little quiet this last week because it's the first week. You've been a little busy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll be back. I generally um, like to post at least once a day and generally deliver how I'm feeling and learnings. And so I'd love to connect with all of you there. Amazing. Well, you've been absolutely incredible and being so honest and candid about your journey has certainly inspired me. So thank you for coming on the show. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. This was great. Good. Well, that's all folks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.